chair and I passed out uh, amendments. Um, this is like not the official language, but we did file uh, amendments that uh, are already at the committee. Um, so um, Chair Boyce and members of the Environment and Transportation Committee, the best committee in the house, the best committee in the world. Um, for the record, I'm Delegate Linda Foley and I'm presenting HB 979, the Biodiversity and Agricultural Protection Act. Um, this legislation is necessary to control the unchecked spread of terrestrial and aquatic invasive species and protect Maryland's natural heritage. The bill would streamline and accelerate the assessment protocol used to determine and prohibit invasive plant species, a cre crucial step in protecting our native ecosystems, biodiversity, agricultural interests, and Maryland's crown jewel, the Chesapeake Bay. Now, those of you who were here last year will remember the famous bamboo bill. Um, so this consider this like the son of the bamboo bill, okay? Um, first, um, uh, and, and it was actually the bamboo bill that got me interested in this because we couldn't ban bamboo on a state level because of the way the, um, the, uh, the in, uh, invasive species law is currently. Uh, first, I wanna thank the Maryland Department of Agriculture, uh, the uh, Department of Natural Resources, and the State Highway Administration for working with us on this bill to get it into condition that everybody um, is good with it. Um, so first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the current law. In 2011, Maryland enacted its first law regulating commercially sold terrestrial invasive plants. It established a two-tier system with some plants being prohibited, those would be tier one, and others requiring warning signage at the point of sale, those would be two tier, that would be tier two, excuse me. In the 13 years since the original 2011 legislation was enacted, only six, six plants have been prohibited under tier one. And 13, only 13 are listed under tier two, despite the rapid spread of invasives in the state uh, that are jeopardizing our ecosystem. The 2011 law did not address aquatic plants or species not considered in commercial Maryland, not considered commercial in Maryland. Both of these are addressed in this bill. There have been, uh, let me just add, there have been no invasive plant assessments done since 2019. So the goal of this bill includes prohibiting harmful invasive plants from being propagated, purchased, or sold in Maryland, adopting a more rapid status assessment protocol to minimize eradication and management costs incurred by the state, combining a two-tiered system of classifying invasive plants into a single prohibited list. Um, and the bill, uh, let me just say that the bill as amended offers a reasonable transition period in order to minimize economic impact on the nursery trade on the prohibited list. And then adding ad aquatic plants to invasive plant regulations. So I'm not gonna get into the weeds uh, so to speak, about the assess sorry, had to make that joke, about the assessment protocols and streamlined procedures outlined in this bill. I'll leave that to my panel, but I do want to address some of the issues that are raised in the written testimony on this bill, which is extensive. First, I'd like to point out that the governor's budget contains funding for three additional agriculture department staff specifically assigned to this program. The additional staff combined with the streamlined assessment process should help Maryland catch up by adding more invasive species to our ban list. Second, let me talk about the ob objections raised by one nursery owner. We worked with the Maryland Green Industry Industries Council, which represents nursery growers, and we've submitted sponsor amendments to clarify that the plants on these invasive lists must be evaluated based on the risk assessment and the authority to recommend their placement on the prohibited plant list. Um, and that still lies, that authority still lies with the Invasive Plant Advisory Committee and the Secretary of Agriculture. There is a process to deregulate sterile cultivars, which is referenced in the letter. Uh, and these amendments would allow the time to do so. So as you will see, the Maryland Green Industries Council representing nursery growers is testifying in favor of this bill with amendments. I also want to address the fiscal concerns raised in the informational written testimony of the State Highway Administration, which are referenced, also referenced in the fiscal note itself. As the SHA testimony notes, we have been working with SHA to mitigate the additional burden on SHA uh, that a consolidated invasive list would pose. 
We've submitted another set of sponsor amendments, which I just passed out, that ameliorate the fiscal concerns raised by SHA and allow the Secretary of Agriculture and SHA to agree on how to dispose of banned plants. That was the SHA's concern. How do we dispose of these banned plants it's now that they're on the ban list? It's our understanding that this will uh, reduce and uh, um, mitigate the additional costs to SHA identified in the fiscal note, and hopefully we'll completely eliminate those. Finally, I want to talk about a Virginia farmer, William P. Mays, uh, who has submitted compelling testimony that I recommend that you read. He says that a neighbor's ornamental planning of the invasive fountain grass has spread over his 225 acres of pasture land where he raises Angus cattle. In just a few years, it has covered 25 to 30 percent of his fields. He's now facing the possibility that sometime in the not too distant future, he will have to close down his livestock business. The economic impact of invasive species in Maryland is substantial, significantly reducing productivity in key business sectors and requiring huge sums for ongoing efforts to manage and mitigate these impacts. The net effect within Maryland could easily, easily be in the billions of dollars. For example, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources has spent approximately $1 million since 2014 to control one invasive species, hydrilla, in one location, Deep Creek Lake. Invasive plants have a serious impact on agriculture. The agricultural yields are reduced by 12% due to invasive plants, despite the $6.6 .6 billion spent annually on pesticides, which can be harmful to workers and to the environment. And then there's the dreaded spotted lanternfly. This invasive pest host is a terrestrial invasive species commonly known as tree of heaven. This bill, it's not banned currently. This bill would ensure that tree of heaven is listed as prohibited and may not be commercially sold in the state. Some invasive plants, I might add, have a direct impact on human health and healthcare costs. Japanese barberry is a host for mice and black-legged ticks that carry Lyme disease. Where there is greater infestation of barberry, there's a greater spread of Lyme disease, which impacts human equine and canine health, as well as livestock. In fact, the Department of Defense considers this to be a threat to military read readiness when it comes on military property. So the first step in protecting Maryland's native species and our biodiversity is to prohibit these plants that impact the health and existence of critical pollinators and flora in the state of Maryland. This bill would help farmers, winemakers, and the recreational industry, and it would also bring much needed relief to public and private property owners and managers who are struggling to contain these invaders. Uh, it is imperative that we enact an updated invasive species assessment protocol to manage and control invasive plant species in Maryland more effectively. Considering these fundamental and costly biodiversity concerns to both the environment and the economy because of a lack of adequate invasive species regulations, I strongly urge a favorable report on HB 979. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. We'll, we'll take your panel first, all of your panel, and then we'll um have the committee ask questions. So um, whoever's next, please make sure you state your name. Good afternoon, Chair Boyce and members of the committee. I'm Marie Laporte on behalf of the Maryland chapter of the Sierra Club and its 70,000 members and supporters in favor of HB 979. While native plants are always the best choice to protect Maryland's wildlife and plants, few non-natives become invasive, just 6%. However, for the plants that do become invasive, their impact is frequently devastating to our biodiversity and costly to agriculture, property owners, and local governments. Invasive plants cause harm in many different ways. Some invasive plants like barberry and Japanese silkgrass alter the soil, which can kill native plant species. Invasive vines strangle and topple our trees. Other invaders crowd out native plants and can completely cover everything in their path. When this happens, the wildlife that depend on the native plants become threatened. Maryland's wildlife has co-evolved with our native plants for over millennia. Many do not adapt when their food and habitat is eradicated within a few decades. Some invasive plants are toxic to our wildlife. 
Songbirds that, that consume Nandina berries can be poisoned by the cyanide they contain. Garlic mustard kills native caterpillars that feed on it. And hydrilla, an aquatic invader that impedes boat traffic, cuts oxygen levels in the water and hosts bacteria that poison birds that consume it. This poison can even move up the food chain and has even killed our bald eagles. Invasive species have contributed solely or alongside other drivers to 60% of the recorded animal and plant extinctions across the globe. Further due to increased global trade, human travel and climate change, the spread of invasive species is accelerating. While we must do more to address this quickly growing threat, we urge a favorable report on HB 979. Thank you. Um, Kirsten Hoffman for the Green Towson Alliance and the Maryland Native Plant Coalition. Um, Chair Boyce and honorable members of the committee. Um, I asked for a favorable report for HB 979, which updates and strengthens Maryland's invasive plant laws to better respond to the extensive environmental and economic damage invasive plants are causing in our state. With a simple walk in the park or drive down one of our roadways, you will undoubtedly see damage being caused by invasive plants. To better understand which invasive plants Maryland citizens are most concerned with, the Maryland Native Plant Coalition conducted a survey asking people to identify their top 25 most problematic invasive plants. In just a few weeks time, we received over 1400 responses from a public that's incredibly frustrated with the destruction they're seeing from invasive plants. Survey respondents came from all regions of our state, from home gardeners to foresters, weed warriors to landscape professionals. They all had similar sentiments, namely, they're spending significant time and money to deal with out of control invasive plants where they live, work and recreate. The most problematic plant in our survey was English ivy, which climbs trees and will eventually smother and kill a tree if not removed. These vines are causing great destruction in our forest, overwhelming trees, and even carpeting the forest floor so new tree seedlings can't germinate. Recent studies are showing that the combined effects of forest fragmentation with rising temperatures due to climate change are like a one-two punch to our forest, with these conditions favoring vines over trees. As Maryland has the goal of increasing our forest canopy, we will fail if we can't control these vines. Japanese barberry, a Maryland tier two invasive plant, also ranked very high in our survey. This shrub's dense growth creates a humid shady microhabitat that supports the black-legged ticks that carry the Lyme disease pathogen. The more barberry in an area, the more Lyme disease. Many of our survey respondents asked, do please help us stop the sale of the most problematic invasive plants. And with your help, the answer is yes. I urge a favorable report on HB 979. <laughs> Just don't touch the button. Good afternoon, Judy Fulton, Vice President of the Maryland Native Plant Society and invasive plant expert. We are in favor of House Bill 979 because of its importance to the health of the environment, Marylanders and the economy. This is a good bill. It simplifies implementation of our current law and makes it more effective. HB 979 will speed up the process of keeping the worst invasives from being grown and sold. I'm going to talk about the bill specifics. Stakeholders input has made this bill much better. We need to work together as a team to win against invasive plants. This bill improves on the existing law by updating three technical components. One, it broadens the scope from banning just a few terrestrial plants sold in nurseries to include aquatics and non-commercial plants. Two, with SB 979, plants determined to be really invasive won't be sold at all. In contrast, existing law allows species here for 50 years or widespread like Barbary and English ivy to be sold with ineffective warning signs. Three, Maryland's existing assessment could take an MDA employee as long as a couple of months for just one species. That's only six in a year out of about 300. This bill specifies a more efficient assessment used in Delaware and most other states. But this bill keeps important parts of the existing law and regs. All sus suspect plants must undergo professional assessments be before being prohibited. The nursery trade can sell existing inventory during a phase and period so they don't lose money. Varieties developed for characteristics like color and size can be sold if sterile. All assessments are still vetted by the Invasive Plant Advisory Committee. 
When I talked with farmer Billy Paul, who submitted the testimony, he asked that we balance the profit on selling just a few plants against his losing his livestock farm to invasive grasses. A new scientific report predicts costs of invasive species will quadruple every 10 years. We need to act now. We urge a favorable report on HB 979. Thank you. One more mention. Thank you, Madam Chair. So MDA, uh, invasive species can harm the environment Your by approaching- the record, dear. Oh, yes, sorry about that. Rachel Jones, uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture. Um, invasive species can harm the environment by encroaching on the food sources and natural habitats of native plants and animals. And MDA's Plant Protection and Weed Management Unit regulates natives and invasives here in the state of Maryland. MDA appreciates that a, a qualified independent assessor has been clearly defined in this bill. The bill will require, will require the assessor to have at least two years of extensive field experience. Additionally, it must have been completed here in Maryland or nearby jurisdictions to ensure that they're closely aligned with our regulatory uh, framework. Assessors will be reviewed and approved by the Secretary of MDA along with DNR and the Invasive Plants Advisory Committee, IPAC, which we appreciate because that reduces the uh, fiscal responsibility that we would have at MDA. As it's already been mentioned, we did request in our FY25 budget three additional pins in order specifically for this department to manage it, the existing issue with uh, invasives with the two-tier system. So this bill will better allow the uh, program to be able to uh, properly get these invasives on the watch list so that we're able to reduce their availability in the general public. And MDA just feels that it's going to uh, be beneficial overall for the environment and we request a favorable report. Let's see, I'm gonna start with uh, Delegate Ziegler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for bringing this bill. This is a huge issue, it really is. Um, but I was curious, what are other, are other states in our region in the Mid-Atlantic doing about this? Are there other state laws that, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Delaware is the most recent uh, law uh, that went into effect in 2022. Uh, and they have prohibited 37 plants from sale and propagation. And that compares to our only six in more than a dozen years because the MDA did not have the staffing or this improved uh, way of assessing them. Uh, the uh, uh, Pennsylvania has 20 uh, that are banned. Virginia has banned 15 and is currently working on additional legislation to address invasive plants. New Jersey has legislation that's been introduced that would ban about 30 plants. New York, um, it's way ahead with 69. Wow. So uh, most states, uh, maybe it might be 44, has some form of banning invasive plants. Uh, and, and also most states are using the assessment tool that this bill includes. Uh, to look at whether plants are invasive. And the more that we operate, not just as a single state, but as for instance, the Mid-Atlantic, the more effective it's going to be because I don't know any plants that can recognize a state border. <laughs> Excellent point, thank you. Thank you, uh, Delegate Ruth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for this bill. I remember last year in subcommittee working on the, the bamboo bill. And uh, so I, I think this is much needed, this, this streamlined process. Are there any um, exceptions to the prohibited list? Uh, definitely. Delegate Foley referred to that. And also, oh, I'm I sorry, did. I missed that. Uh, no, it was just in passing. <laughs> um, so if there's no risk that an invasive species is going to spread, uh, then information on that species can be submitted. This is not a change from what's been done all along. This is just keeping uh, what we've done in the past. Now, 
that was not in the law before in the existing law. So we've made it explicit in the law because that's something that the nursery trade really wanted to see in writing. Okay. Uh, and plants can spread either by seed or you know, if the roots get taken off or different parts, it can spread by that. So it needs to be sterile in you know, whatever way they might start spreading. Hey, thank you. Delegates Rasa. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, although, I, and I apologize that that's this is wasn't going to be my question, but I'm now curious as how something that's invasive wouldn't spread. Like, isn't that sort of what I just from a lay perspective? I thought like lay that sounds like it would spread. So if there's um say a burning bush or a nandina, they're different. Those are different species. I don't know how many people are gardeners here. Um, if it they didn't put off out any viable seed, mm -hmm. and some species, it's not the species itself, the straight species that would be sterile. It would be a cultivar, which is really a variety that's been developed in okay. like nurseries. So some nurseries have been able okay. to develop varieties that um don't 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 have viable speed as uh, seed and can't spread like bamboo since we we're talking about bamboo bamboo only gets seeds maybe once every 60 years but if you take a bit of their underground you know roots and stuff and maybe there's a storm or something and it washes to another area a new bamboo grove is going to grow there. So you ha when you are looking at a straight species that's invasive, there's no way it's going to be sterile. But it's these cultivars that might be. And that needs to be, uh, just as um, Rachel was saying, um, those need to go through an assessment and go through the, the uh, committee, IPAC. And if they're determined to be uh, sterile, like Nandina firepower uh, is one of the excluded plants that doesn't need to be listed because it never has babies. Okay, thank you. And <clears throat> thank you to Delegate Foley for, uh, I love that I'm always learning more from <laughs> this legislation. Let me go back to the question, if that's okay, Madam Chair. The, um, tier two invasive plants, let me just understand this right. They can be sold, but they have to have a sign indicating is that that's right and then is that something that you found helpful elsewhere oh, oh. um go ahead oh, I should go. okay yeah. um so yeah they they have a sign that says you know plant with caution so if you're talking about since people mentioned it the japanese barbary that will have a sign that says caution you know this you might want to pay attention to this and that's not really very effective. Okay. Uh, if people don't understand about why that sign is there, and there's something that looks nice and their neighbors have it, they're going to get it anyway. Gotcha. Thank if, you. I, if I could just add, I think the testimony, the unfavorable testimony, the one unfavorable testimony in this bill is from a nursery owner. And I understand that he has real concerns about this effect on his business. And we've tried to address those, as we said, but the concern he has is he's been selling tier two and now he's not gonna be able to. Mm -hmm. So that kind of proves the, you know, the need, I think the need for the bill. Okay, thank you. Delegate Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> thank you for the bill. I'm a little confused. Um, I get the, invasiveness I use of English ivy because I've spent days at my house climbing a tree trying to cut it so that the top will die and eventually you know it's going to come back but at least the tree's not going to get so heavy because the stuff does weigh a lot in yeah. a storm it can fall on top of your house and okay. make a big mess and I've okay. seen that happen nearby so you got state highway involved is state highway going to be involved in not planting, or are they going to be concerned with trying to, you know, English ivy, kudzu that grows all over the place, you see it on the trees. Are they involved in trying to eradicate it? I, I think I can answer that. I might need help from Rachel, but I think I can answer that. So 
the reason state highway weighed in here is because they already have invasives that they planted over the years that yeah. are there. Uh, and when they, I mean, you'll remember Delegate Ruth, for example, had a bill that they need to plant native plants uh, at State Highway. That's a bill that she has. But um, it's not that they're they're planting them, it's that they already have them. And so as a result, this bill does talk about, I mean, the law does talk about, uh, it doesn't talk about eradication. There's nothing in the bill about requiring eradication, but between regulation and um and the fact that you can't transport them um, and, uh, you know, and a, a couple of other tra um, tangential things that are already in the law. The fact that we're taking all those tier two plants and moving them to tier one will require state highway to make some changes and um, and ha and have eradication procedures that they have to follow. So what we did was we allowed them to work that out with the Secretary of Agriculture so that they would not be adversely, fiscally adversely impacted by the bill. That was not the reason for the bill, right? Okay. Did Thank I get you. that right? Sure, so so part of um, SHA's concern was that, um, I think the bill as originally written would have required that they remove invasives um, and other noxious weeds uh, from various highways owned by the state at the discretion of the Secretary of Agriculture, and they weren't comfortable with that. Um, SHA, and I, I believe they did submit a letter of information as well, but it was their position that it would be too cumbersome and increase the fiscal note on their end if they had to deploy employees and staff at the behest of MDA to remove these plants. And so I believe Delegate Foley filed amendments that would say that they don't have to do that based on the discretion of the secretary. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair Boyce. Thank you so much. And thank you, Delegate Foley, for bringing another interestingly complicated <laughs> invasive bill. Um, still running from bamboo last year. Um, so, so I want to go back to the question one about tier twos. And so, and, and, and I do sympathize with the individual because it, I mean, isn't it so we've created this law saying that these folks can sell this, sell these tier two type plants under conditions that we have to give these signs. And I guess I'm trying to figure out is that who would otherwise be inspecting to ensure individuals, nurseries selling tier two um, invasive, invasive plants that, that, are, that they actually have the sign, right? Because I'm sure they're all over my house somewhere or I've planted them somewhere in the backyard with the exception of bamboo. But um, so, I, I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, user error as it relates to um, uh, the retailer's um, inability to, to kind of post the right information. Can we start there? Please. Yeah, you want to direct sure. that. I'm going to let Rachel address that. Sure. So, Madam Chair, the issue with that is when the bill originally passed, it was sort of like an unfunded mandate for MDA, where the, the onus was going to be on our, our plant management folks to be able to go to every store and inspect. However, the staff just was not able to complete those tasks. And so, currently, what you have is Yes, there's a law that says MDA is supposed to verify that the, this signage exists at various retailers that are selling tier two plants, and they have not been able to adequately keep up with sending inspectors out due to lack of staffing and other um, responsibilities. And so that's also part of what this bill addresses by having the IPAC come in and participate with having a watch list and by simply eliminating the tiers. Okay, and then I have two more questions. But the second question is, um, I, I forget, let me see. I I think that was Marie? Marie? No, I'm sorry, the, Judy. Um, and Judy, I'm sorry. You, you mentioned um, uh, cultivars and how I think to delegate, I think Ruth or to Ross's point about um, in, invasives that aren't invasive, but have developed or been breeded to be and, and so under this particular bill, those types of plants could be categorized as, as tier two, but could still be sold potentially. So existing 
law allows for tier two. But this law gets rid of that and just if it's invasive it's and invasive. it's going to cause harm, why keep on selling it? Mm -hmm. It's just going to be prohibited. And as Rachel said, one of the problems was those tier two plants had the signage and the ex inspectors had to go and check, you know, walk through a store uh, and see that those signs were up. That's taken away. There'll be no more tier two. However, for the trade, because the trade might you know, want to sell a sterile cultivar, those again can be excluded. The way the law has worked. Yeah, so you've answered my question. So, so someone would check to ensure that they were sterile and they could still be sold traditionally as a tier two, but under this bill as just a total they could just plain be sold. They would no okay. longer be tier two. Oh, I get that part. I'm just yeah. I'm talking old versus new. I'm, I'm, I'm but working towards that. that. It's a formal assessment that sure. would be done. And that would go through the existing committee. But that's always happened. Like I mentioned, right. Andina Firepower, that, that went is. through IPAC. That's okay. a variety that's sterile. Sure. Okay. okay. So, and my last question is, is how, how many plants are we talking about in Maryland that would be it potentially quote unquote ban. And could you give us an example that's not bamboo, that <laughs> is something that we may all have either in our houses or plants somewhere that we're talking about. So people have a bit more context like myself, please. Um, so I mentioned that there's six plants and so did Delegate okay. Foley. So that was six. Okay. But there are 13 that are tier two right now. And after those are assessed and uh, looked at by IPAC, the assessments, those would move to the prohibited list. Uh, those include, I bet a lot of people have wisteria. Do people have wisteria? Do you know oh, that? It's a fine I, with purple. It's really beautiful. I but think it, I have that. <laughs> um, inside, inside. <laughs> um, another I the list. Uh, you sure you yeah, so I have the list right here, uh, Madam Chair, Vice Chair. Um, so the band plants are incised fumewort, winter creeper, fig buttercup, or le it's also known as lesser salandine, 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 shining geranium, yellow flag, pale yellow iris, water flag. Those are all the same plant. They're just known by different names. And amur honeysuckle. Those are the band ones. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, they're not all varieties of honeysuckle, just this variety, sure. right? So then um, the ones on tier two right now that would become banned uh, under this law are Japanese angelica tree, Japanese barberry, which we mentioned, scotch broom, which is another one that people really don't like, burning bush, or also known as winged Eo, Eo, mine. How do you <laughs> say Euonymous. it? Euonymous. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Delegate, Florida, just give us give us one that would be common. Nandina. Okay. Nandina, but not sterile Nandina. Another one is Wisteria. Japanese and Chinese Wisteria are two different ones. And then there's um, there's a calorie pear. I don't know what that is. Is that a Bradford, Bradford, Bradford yeah. pear? I thought so. Yeah. So if you're going down in the spring, you're driving down the highway and you see all these yellow flowers of these like short trees by the sides of the roads, that's calorie pear or Bradford pear. So that's escaped all over. And in fact, that's one of the plants that state highways is most concerned about because it's by the sides of the road and they, they know that they, they need to remove it because it's causing damage. So that's one of them that they're concerned about. They're also about um, 45 additional species that are included in the 2022 delegate, uh, Senator Elfrith's um, uh, bill uh, on invasive plants. And she said that there's a, a book, which actually I'm on a, the co-author on a more current version of that called Plant Invaders of Mid-Atlantic Natural Areas. And there is a list of plants in there that according to the 2022 bill need to be assessed. 
And then there are additional bills that are not, additional plants that are not in those two groups that have in the meantime or all along been considered uh, to be invasive and those could be assessed. You mentioned English ivy, that's in the plant invaders book. Yeah. Delegate Tarasa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Bradford Piers, I don't know if it's just in Howard County, but that was sort of like the developer tree of choice. It it was, and it's bad. <laughs> That's my, okay, thank you. Delegate Huey. Uh, I've also, um, two things I wanted to ask you. The Bradford Piers, I know probably in the 80s or the 70s, the the, the they planted them all over the place and it, along in the Park and Planning Commission did it, the county governments did it. The, the, it was like given or sold to as the solution of, you know, boulevard kind of trees. And um, so how did and they are invasive? Where did they come from? I thought they were like developed on a farm like Bark or someplace. So originally they thought the Bradford pear was sterile. But the only problem was it didn't have a date. So it, they developed other varieties besides Bradford and all of a sudden you know, they they could cross pollinate. There was a date for that. So that's why it's so important when you're looking at a species and you're looking at a variety that you check that it really is sterile. The other thing they didn't realize and has turned into a big problem is the structure of the tree is such that branches tend to fall off and hit people on the head or hit cars. So when they decided to plant that all over the place, they didn't realize it wasn't sterile and they didn't realize it was dangerous. Okay, so are we in a better position now to, to um, have that kind of information before we start putting stuff out for the public to use? Yes. Okay, that's that's really my question. <laughs> the other question I had was about the English Ivy, because that seems to be everywhere. I mean, you know, the Ivy League, the wide colored walls, all, all of that stuff, uh, is that's English Ivy, right? That's English Ivy. And that's been around a long time, but it's English, it's not native. It's not native and it's really damaging. And uh, that has not, it's not on tier two because it hasn't been assessed yet. But if it were assessed with the existing law, because it's been around for more than 50 years, there's no way they put it on the banned list. So that's a good example of a plant that with the existing law could still be sold but with Delegate Foley's law, it would no longer be able to be sold once it was assessed. Thank you very much. I do not see any additional questions for the sponsor of her panel. I know there are additional favorable witnesses. First of all, I'm not positive we got Marie Laporte from the Sarah Club. If she not, was here. She great, sorry, so I wasn't in the room. So Jesse Illiff, Severn River Association, Ashley Bowers, City of Baltimore Department of Recs and Parks Forestry Division, uh, Jeremy Todd. Bonaterra LLC. Please go ahead when you're ready. Sure. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the Honorable Committee. My name is Ashley Bowers, Environmental Policy Analyst for Baltimore City's Department of Recreation and Parks. Our agency, recognized nationwide as a leader in urban forest management, is responsible for stewarding over 2,300 acres of natural areas across Baltimore City. These forests, stream valleys, and wetlands provide essential public health benefits and other ecosystem services to our communities, but they face significant threats from non-native invasive plant species. Given the rapid rate that invasives can dominate healthy native plant communities, our projections for restoring ecosystem health and functionality often look bleak. Scientific consensus is clear that the best chance we have at maintaining resilient natural areas in our urban and suburban communities come down to two things, 
preventing disturbances of these landscapes to begin with and slowing the rate of invasive plant infestations. Since 2019, we have invested over $300,000 to combat invasives while only scratching the surface of the overall needs for removals in Baltimore City. Unaddressed, all 13 species on Maryland's tier two invasive species list run rampant in our park system. In addition to our agency expenditures to contain the spread of these habitat destroyers, every year hundreds of residents attend our educational seminars and log thousands of volunteer hours, removing them from our parks and neighborhoods. Finally, we acknowledge the importance of, of minimizing trade impacts in the passing of this bill and want to assure the committee that agencies such as our own are committed to supporting the transition away from non-native invasive species in the nursery industry. Our department annually orders on average one and a half million dollars worth of native vegetation. We're actively shaping industry demand to enhance and protect biodiversity within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. A favorable report for HB 979 is vital to preventing the spread of economically and environmentally harmful species. Thank you for your consideration. <laughs> Thank you. Chair Corman, Vice Chair Boyce, members of the committee. My name is Jesse Iliff. I'm Executive Director of the Severn River Association, strongly in support of this bill. Uh, many of the prior witnesses explained a lot of the environmental damages and economic damages and risks to human health that these invasive species pose. So I don't want to repeat all that, but I do want to come from the position of a watershed ad advocate to explain how the Vines especially that kill trees will result in degradation of water quality in a few different ways. The first is that they kill the trees, so the trees aren't going to infiltrate stormwater like they usually do, which is much better than many other plants. The second is that as they kill the trees, they fall over oftentimes when they're next to a stream and the root beds can cause erosion of the stream channel. Finally, or not finally, sorry, uh, also, they, when the trees die, they no longer shade the streams, and so the water can warm up, and that causes more algal blooms downstream. And then finally, there's emerging science that indicates uh, that many of these plants can alter the soil chemistry, which causes the soil to be less absorptive of stormwater, and therefore there's more runoff and more pollution. Uh, the, the delegate mentioned that the prior process has basically exempted plants that have been well established in the state from being banned for sale and this strikes me as just a really silly way to go about regulating things it's sort of like telling a lung cancer patient they can go ahead and keep smoking because the damage has already been done and anybody that cares about somebody like that wouldn't give that advice if we care about our natural areas in the state of maryland we shouldn't be allowing people to keep pouring more and more of these problematic species into our natural areas so for all those reasons, I th think that uh, House Bill 979 is a great bill and I urge a favorable report. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeremy Tidd. I'm the owner of Bonaterra Native Plant Nursery and I'm strongly advocating for the passage of Bill HB 979. In my 20 plus years of experience in the horticultural industry, I've witnessed firsthand the detrimental impact invasive plants have on our environment and economy. During my early years at a conventional plant nursery, I saw people's desire to connect with nature through landscape. They would come in with the best of intentions to steward their land and often leave with invasive plants in hand. Those customers rely on nurseries to sell them plants that enhance their property and all too often leave with plants that not only take over their properties, but also wreak havoc on the surrounding community. It requires expertise to determine if the plants are going to be invasive and only a small fraction of consumers have that expertise. This bill would provide consumer protection. As a landscape contractor, I've worked on thousands of gardens. Every single property I've worked on has been negatively impacted in some way by invasive species, whether homeowners inherited these problems or inadvertently caused them. Many clients were overwhelmed or didn't fully grasp the importance of addressing the issue. Others simply couldn't afford to fix the problem someone else created. A science-based Maryland state list of invasive plant species would provide a crucial resource for contractors guiding clients towards informed decisions and help mitigate hidden expenses being passed to future property owners. As an owner of a native plant nursery in Maryland, invasives take my time and divert my clients' resources before they even come to the door. 50% of the time it takes to establish a new production garden bed in the nursery goes to removing invasives. 
Once it's established, controlling invasives consumes up to 50% of my maintenance budget, which significantly impacts retail prices, my ability to scale up my business, and the effectiveness of my efforts to provide native plants. The passage of the spill is an essential step towards protecting Maryland's environment, economy, and native biodiversity. By banning invasive plants, we can mitigate their harmful effects. Thank you all. Are there any questions for this panel? Okay, uh, thank you very much. We have a bunch of favorable with, uh, amendment testimony. Lindsay Thompson, Maryland Green Industries Council, Larry Hemming, uh, same group, uh, John Murphy, same group. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, Lindsay Thompson here on behalf of the Maryland Green Industries Council, favorable with amendments on this legislation. I'd first like to thank Delegate Foley, as well as the Maryland Native Plants Coalition for reaching out to us and helping us iron out these issues before the hearing. That was really helpful. Um, so a couple of the amendments I would like to go through and just explain the reason for them and the rationale. Uh, the first one is a pretty easy one. So on page six, lines 15 through 17, you'll see a reference to the Mid-Atlantic Plant Invaders list. As drafted, this bill would have automatically included all of the Mid-Atlantic Plant Invaders plants on the prohibited plants list. This clarifies that they too will have to go through the risk assessment and be recommended by IPAC for that prohibited plants list. The next couple of amendments speak to the issue of the cultivars that you have heard a lot about. So many of our nursery growers are growing cultivars of the tier two plants because they have been allowed to do so. And this would clarify that these tier two plants would have to go through the risk assessment process and be recommended by IPAC and approved by the Secretary of Agriculture to be added to the prohibited plants list. There is a process currently for these cultivars to go through what is called the infra taxon protocol, but with existing resources and staffing, that hasn't been a very fast process. So we are hopeful by that requiring these tier two plants to go through that process, it will also give us time to have these cultivars go through the infra taxon process. So there will not be significant interruption to the nursery growers that are responsibly growing these tier two cultivars and not have undue harm to their financial success as those nursery growers. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hello, Larry Hemming. Uh, I'm a owner of a fifth generation nursery. Uh, we've been in business for 95 years. Uh, I'm also a member of the IPAC Council. Uh, I would like to see, I see this as improving IPAC to help them. Uh, the biggest thing is nobody's around to do the assessments. And that's going to be key to the IPAC law or this law. Um, so that's, that's number one. The other thing is I'm also very afraid we're going to be told we can't sell them. These people are going to want these plants. Uh, they're going to get them either A, from out of state, uh, or B, there's going to be probably some problems with some of the larger big box stores because the people that order the plants are ordering the plants from, they're, living, they're in Ohio. They don't know Maryland law. So there's going to be need for more people to inspect all places that sell plants, just not the nurseries and garden centers. Uh, as I've said, I've been in business for 95 years. There's a lot of plants that aren't on tier two. I don't sell because I don't, I think they're too, too invasive. English ivy, I haven't sold for 25 years. Um, certain plants, yes, I do still sell as their cultivars. I uh, generally don't sell any straight species of the barberry. I sell a few cultivars of the barberry, but not many. It's not a big, big deal for me. Uh, the Nandina cultivars are probably my biggest concern, to be honest. Uh, as for the signs, they work and they don't work. I have have people that will tell me, you know, why is this here? And I explain to them and I will tell them why it's invasive and 
if they're telling me that you live in the woods and they're going to plant it on the edge of the woods, I'm going to flat out tell them, don't plant it there. Uh, if they're planting it in a circular island and it's not certain plants, I can say, okay, that'll be fine. But that's all I have to say if I'm more than, more than willing to ask and answer any questions. Thank you. I'm John Murphy. I chair of Magic, the Maryland Green Industry Council, which includes the Maryland Nursery Landscape Greenhouse Growers Association, Maryland Arbors Association, Maryland, Maryland Association of Green Industries, and Frederick Area Landscape Contractors. Um, I want to thank um, Christian and, and Senator Foley for bringing this um, to you all. Um, we understand the invasives out there. We've been working on, uh, as you know, Larry had just mentioned on the IPAC. Uh, I think the largest problem is the funding. Um, enough staff. You heard Rachel Jones from the MDA um, about needing staff. It's not the industry that's uh, against invasives. It's more the cultivars. Um, this isn't my lunch, but I think we all no to Honeycrisp apple. Um, the Honeycrisp apple is a cultivar of the apple. Uh, one of my childhood heroes wasn't Spider-Man, it was Johnny Appleseed. Mm -hmm. um, I would have been laying on the moon, but John Glenn beat me um, and John Henry and all that. But anyway, um, the apples came from Asia. They did some, a lot of work studying or teaching in um, uh, Asia and apples came from Asia. Um, they came over here. We're not sure how they got here. They probably came from the colonists spreading the seeds. And then from Europe, we brought the apple and we came up with these cultivars. These cultivars aren't tough. Um, yes, they can reseed and get out there, but it takes disturbed land to really get the crab apples going. Crab apples are invasive in New York. They're not listed as invasive in New York. And it's a good thing because they were a big industry. We probably wouldn't have honey crisp so it's not that we're against this we support it we just need amendments for the cultivars thank you thank you very much i do not see up uh, oh, i'm sorry delegate jacobs <clears throat> mr chairman so lindsay um based on the um uh, on the amendments how do you understand the consolidation of the tier one uh one and two is going to work Yes, thank you. So that was one of the primary amendments that we worked with the proponents of the bill on. Um, in response to one of Delegate Boyce's questions, the comment was made that once those 13 species on tier two are assessed, they will be added to the prohibited plants list. Our understanding or our agreement based on the amendments that we put forth is that those tier two plants would be evaluated based on the risk assessment and they would still have to go to IPAC for them to recommend whether or not those tier two plants would be put on the prohibited plants list and approved by the secretary. And if they were not, then they would be put on the watch list essentially. Um, so that's our understanding is they would have to under. Correct. Okay. Yep. No, oh, everybody's nodding their head. That's a good sign, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Madam Vice Chair. So, so to be clear, we have two new lists, banned and watched. So we already have a ban. So I see head shaking in the back. We we already have a tier one, yep. which is banned, right? And a tier two, which requires the signage, right? right? This would move to a prohibited plants list. And then there would be a watch list. So there's two lists. So under this bill, there'll be two, two, two new lists replacing the old lists per se. Yes. And so, and maybe this, this is not related, but explain um, non-native and in, invasive. Yeah, it, is it the same difference? Or, no. I, okay. I just, okay. I, I can, I can ex try to explain it. Um, invasive is like the, uh, the English ivy that everybody agrees that just takes over the world of uh, given half a chance. A non-native plant would be, say, something like a katsura tree. 
It's not, it's not, doesn't really seed itself. It's pretty sterile. It's a nice tree, but it comes from Asia. People like it because it has pretty fall color. Also, people like it because deer don't eat it. Um, Sensitive topic here. So <laughs> that that would be a tap. That would be a non-native tree that probably would still be sold because it's not invasive and it is aesthetically pleasing to people. I just want to make sure that I, I'm clear that non-native and invasive are not like synonymous. They're, no, they're not. Good. You, right we now. can have native plants that are also invasive. That is true. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, I do not see any additional questions for this panel. So thank you. We do have one unfavorable in-person witness, John Marshall from Marshall's Riverbank Nurseries. Good afternoon, delegates. Uh, my name's John Marshall. Uh, I put in unfavorable because before the amendments, it was unfavorable. Um, I am still concerned that this in issue, which has been interesting to hear everybody try and understand of growing cultivars of, of plants that can potentially be invasive, it isn't very clear. It's a complicated issue. And I am concerned that the MDA, who has not had the funding to do this research, and there, there is a process in place, the IPAC, which has not been funded, that that is not going to happen. Uh, the plants that are in, how much time? I've got a minute 20. Um, so I would like you to think about your favorite landscape plant. There are a lot of different ones. Nandina, crepe myrtle, roses, lilacs. Um, on my list here, I can't remember all of them. Um, boxwood, Rose of Sharon, Japanese holly are all non-native plants. Some are considered invasive, some are not. If you look in the shopping centers, your churches, places of worship, public spaces, and in your yards, many of these plants and some on the tier two list are what is in your yard. This is what our customers ask for. They, uneducation is a problem. Bradford pear was not known to be an invasive plant when it was planted, but it became an invasive plant. It's become a big problem. Um, our nursery, you know, we, we employ 100 people in 20 years. We've gone from not having a nursery to we have over $5 million of payroll. We have 100 people that are local people. They all live in the United States year round. They don't, don't go to another country. Uh, I think the biggest thing, I'm going to take a few extra seconds. The biggest thing is when you, when you think about a business like McDonald's or Chick-fil-A to sell their hamburgers and their chicken sandwiches, they need milkshakes, French fries, and um, whatever to go with it. Taking these plants away from our business will take 7% of our revenue, about $1.2 million. The problem is some of my customers customers start their orders with some of the plants that are on this list. And only about a third of our production goes into Maryland. Much of it goes to 12 other states as far as Maine and as far west as Michigan. If those customers cannot get the products that they want from us, it's like going to the store. If, you, if their bread is not there, you're going to go to a different store. We're going to lose some business uh, over that 7% by not having what our customers ask for. Landscape architects are not great about worrying about invasive plants. So we're just, you know, it's, I think enough has been said, but it, it is still a concern that the MDA will be able to assess all these plants that are still so popular. So, great. There is a question for you, sir. So okay. Pop up. Vice I want to be done. Thank you. Had made a lot of statements, and so yeah. I want to be clear. Yeah. And so you, you're, you, so you said a seven percent of your business would be affected if you can't sell these these plants. Can you equate that to what does that look like on the ground as far as people? As far as you said, you hired you hire a hundred. We have a hundred staff. So yeah. if if seven percent of of your business is gone, what does that look like for your employees? Are you do you well, fire people? So. 
I, I don't know that we would fire people. Um, we're a $15 million business. Um, 1.2 million, almost okay, one point. different perspective then. Yeah, so $15 million business. Um, last, what I, so I was, you know, I was talking to my staff about some of this and I got the feeling that they're like, yeah, whatever. I said, well, we did $250,000 of Christmas bonuses last year. If we don't receive this 1.2 million, we're probably not going to do any Christmas bonuses this but year. But they won't lose their jobs. No. Thank you. But they weren't happy about that. No. So, no, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, th thank you, sir. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, because I was a little confused by your remarks. Um, with the amendments, are you still unfavorable? I'm not trusting that the amendments are going to solve our problems, but I am. I'm. I'm not sure where I am. I'm. I'm on the fence. Okay, thank you. I guess that's that's yeah, why it wasn't yeah. clear. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I definitely am sympathetic to the the you know pressures on your business, and that's always hard when there are changes, and unfortunately, sometimes changes have have to happen um, as we you know learn more things and as things change and. So given everything that we've heard today about the damage that, that some of these plants can really cause, um, do, do you think it's, you know, appropriate to continue selling plants that can cause so much damage um, just because people want them? I mean. Well, I think Barberry is an excellent example. There's been a lot of research by companies because bar Barberry is very popular and there are varieties that are sterile, but most states have not done anything to allow the production the states that have that have uh, new york is an example they do not allow barberry these sterile varieties are not allowed either so barberry is just out so um but i think and maybe i am not completely understanding but with the amendments i think we're um allowing the the sterile varieties well if it can get done okay is the money going to be provided is the staff going to be provided all right thank you so much yeah Great. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, sir. We appreciate you being here. That concludes the bill hearing on HB 979. We'll now turn to Speaker Pro Tem Stein, HB 992, Environment Delegated Authorities, Well and Septic Program Permits. And feel free to bring up a panelist if you have one. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mr.